Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming in a new Elden Ring Things You Didn't Know video. In this long running series we look at the big and small details of the game, whether it's interesting lore discoveries or discussions, useful mechanics or tricks, and as always it is largely kept going by you guys in the comments making suggestions with your own discoveries. Before we get into today's episode though, I just want to say thank you. I was really ill last week and it obviously showed in the videos. I was worried that it would kind of ruin the episodes and make them unwatchable, but a lot of people were very kind, very nice, and I'm feeling better now, so thank you very much for that support. But with all that said and out of the way, let's get into today's episode. We're going to kick off today's episode with the first thing here in the underground city of Nokron, where the stars remain in the sky even though we're actually in a cave. And I'm holding this weapon for a very specific reason, because this weapon, the Sacred Relic Sword, as we all know, is made from the flesh of two people, Marika and Radigan. At the end of the game, after you defeat Radigan, his body is then transformed, molded into the weapon that the Elden Beast uses against you in that fight. And this weapon is obviously a small version of that, which gives us the nice opportunity to zoom in on it and take a really good look at it. It is literally the, the flesh, the bone, the skeleton of Radagon that's been melded into this pointed blade to be used as a weapon. It's gnarly, it's metal, it's horrible, it's really cool. But it was a few people in the comments who brought up how this is actually a very familiar thing and referenced earlier in the game before you ever do that final fight. Ray Blitz talked about how the Finger Slayer Blade, which you get here behind me, looks very similar to the Sacred Relic Sword, which is made from a corpse. Let's read the description of the Finger Slayer Blade. The hidden treasure of the eternal city of Nokron, a blade said to have been born of a corpse. This blood-drenched fetish is proof of the high treason committed by the eternal city and symbolizes its downfall. It cannot be wielded by those without a fate, but is said to be able to harm the greater will and its vassals. As we know, this is what we end up giving to Rani in her storyline so she can kill her own fingers, aka the vassal or a vassal of the greater will, ultimately take control at the end in her ending. So this incredibly powerful weapon forged from a body with the same kind of twist, it's just more of a curved dagger or short sword compared to the great sword that we have here. My question is, well, who made that then? And who is it made of? It must be made of an incredibly powerful character, maybe an Empyrean, maybe one that was previously in charge. Proof of the high treason and symbolizes its downfall. I think this was actually made after Nokron's downfall. The leader of this faction, the Nokron faction, turned into that weapon, then stored away in shame at the heart of the capital. I don't think it's someone like the Glomide or Duskai Queen, because that's a different faction and obviously all the resources to do that are found elsewhere. So who was their person in charge? Was it an Empyrean? Was it a former ruler of this faction? It's all very interesting to think about. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Next, we have one from the Jack Niles in the comments with a really cute, quick detail to do with our favorite horse here, Torrin. As you might know, you can cast incantations or spells from the back of Torrin, allowing you to basically have ranged attacks while moving, which is an incredibly useful thing. However, you must have the seal or the staff or whatever in the main hand. So before actually mounting up, you want to two hand that and then obviously activate the mount. A simple but important thing to know if you are considering using that, if you have that option. But Jack actually references a little cute detail that I've never stopped to look at. When I'm casting these spells or incantations while moving, I just try to throw them, focus on what I'm doing, you know, hit the target, maybe avoid the incoming blow at the same time. That's what I'm looking at. What I'm not looking at is Torrin, who does this very cute little detail, lowers his head to avoid being hit by the spell or the incantation to keep out of the way so that you can do your thing. And he will just keep his head down the whole time that you're casting your spells or otherwise. And eventually when you're done, raise his head again, which is really cute and a real subtle detail. I've never actually noticed because I guess I've just never stopped to look at Torrin when I'm doing these things for obvious reasons. These are some of my favorite little details to talk about in this series because they've been there from the start. But it's not until now when we're really stopping to look at the details and really see what else we've not noticed that you start to notice and talk about things like this. So thank you, Jack. I really like this one. Adds a bit of character to Torrent, which is always good. 
Next up, we have a little tip to do with one of the coolest Ashes of War in the game, in my opinion. This is the Phantom Slash combo, which allows you to use this Spectral Helper to deal damage at range, while also attacking with your own weapon at the same time. It's really cool in combination, can be really fun and effective in PvP, and I think it is honestly one of the coolest and kind of underrated Ashes of War you can find in the game. But did you know you could also use it as an evade as well as an attack? By simply running and attacking in a direction, you will move and dash forward after the strike. It's not until you actually auto lock or target onto something that the ghost is going to go directly to that and obviously that will bring you to it at the same time. But a really cool trick that I've only recently realized and discovered is that you can target, activate the Ash of War and then get rid of the target. Meaning you'll send the ghost at the target while you evade and move in a different direction or potentially even hit a different enemy. It's a really cool little tech technique that you can do so let's give it a go so i'm going to do the ash and then i'm going to not target you see how the the actual phantom goes to the target landing the blow while i move maybe hit another target or even just evade its attack such as the arrow at the same time i really like that it's a very little detail but important to know if you are using this ash because it gives you further options it could actually be really useful in something like pvp where you're trying to evade and punish someone at range or medium range at the same time i think that's fantastic and a little detail to know if you are using this ash i can even put like a lot of space between me and that target which is pretty cool Next, a follow-up from a previous thing we talked about in a previous episode to do the Blasphemous Blade. I talked about how you can summon the Mimic and have it kill things and you'll still get the lifesteal on Killing Blow, which is really cool. But a bunch of you guys in the comments let me know that this actually applies to a bunch of other things. And further, you don't even need to be the one dealing damage. You don't need to have an ally dealing damage like a summon. It can just be anyone that's dying in the nearby area. So that works with the Blasphemous Blade, but it also works with weapons like the Sword of Milos and other lifesteal weapons. Even talismans like Taker's Cameo, restoring health upon defeating enemies. Or the Ancestral Spirit Horn Talisman as well, further giving you health and FP when enemies die. You might think to your damage or you, but it's just in general. When anything dies near you, you get these runes, right? So if an enemy falls off a cliff nearby you, runes will be given to you and you've not dealt any damage or killed anything. And because of that, that triggers on these weapons, on these talismans. By simply being near enemies that are dying, you will get these effects, health and FP back and so on. There you go, so I just got health and FP because that guy died, even though I did absolutely nothing. No damage, nothing at all. And again, this guy's about to die, so health and FP, even though I've done nothing at all. That's incredibly useful to know because it means you don't need to do a summon if you're trying to get some cheeky health from a distance and have an ally deal the damage. You just need to find some enemies fighting one another or falling off a cliff in a funny way. That's also entirely possible or valid. This is great because I'm doing absolutely nothing and I'm getting my health back, I'm getting my FP back. This could be really useful for an early game playthrough where you're trying to maximize your FP, your health, your resources and casting a lot of spells or incantations yourself. It's good to know how it specifically works and how to get the benefit though. So thanks for for the update and clarification on that in the comments of last time. Next, we have one from the comments by Isaac Browning with a really cool detail that he's noticed to do with the Clean Rot Knights. However, I'm looking at this talisman, right? The Rotten Winged Sword Insignia, which if you've seen any of my build videos recently with the fast quick weapons, boosts your attack power when you deal successive attacks. So as you land more and more attacks in a row, you're gonna increase your AR and skyrocket the damage you can be dealing. It's a very, very good talisman and it's tied to the Millicent storyline. Although she's not a Clean Rot Knight, she's obviously tied to them. If we read the description it says a talisman depicting a raised prosthetic blade so melania's blade this is an honor this talisman bestowed upon the valkyries who serve the goddess of rot so melania would give the valkyries maybe like the highest most prestigious strongest ones this insignia as a token to acknowledge them then it's mechanic description and law description to do with millicent but doesn't this mean that the clean rot knights have their own insignia, meaning they have their own talisman. Does that mean they literally have the Rotten Wing Sword insignia? This talisman and this effect, meaning their attack power will actually go up the more they hit you or the targets. To see this effect in play, let's just go hit some enemies. So hitting him a few times, and now you can see I have these red lines around me to show that I've hit multiple times and I have that temporary buff. My AR has gone up because I've landed multiple blows. Looking at my AR then, it's 666, and it's dropped down now to 581, and the effect of the red lines, they're gone now. It took me about three hits for that to actually begin. Let's see if we can get a clean rot knight to do the same. One, 
Yes, there it is. She has her red lines. Very brief, briefly for just a moment, I saw them. And again, you see them? There are the red lines again. Her AR is going up. She's literally holding and using one of those talismans. What a subtle little detail that actually is. These NPCs actually have that effect. It was Isaac himself who mentioned how cool this is, that they've included such a fine and small detail in the game, showing the connection between Melania and her very precious to her, very important to her, Clean Rot Knights. The only other detail that would be cool that I don't think is the case is if only a few specific Clean Rot Knights that you find in specific places, if they had this effect, you know, to show that these are the special ones that have earned their own insignia. But it seems to be the case that it's just Clean Rot Knights in general that have that passive effect. But still, a really cool detail. But there you have it, another Things episode down and done. Thank you for all the help with this episode today. It was almost entirely you guys in the comments making suggestions for these ones today. So as always, if you have anything that you haven't seen in this series before, you've discovered or seen recently, then let me know in the comments. I might just give you a shout out. It might just be included in the video. For now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage Is, uh, goodbye